the house of the Lord this morning are called to worship from Psalm 98. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of all the nations. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. Open this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our order of service continues as printed there in your bulletin. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And let us humbly kneel or bow, confess our sins unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only begotten Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives the power to become the children of God and grants unto them his Holy Spirit. The one who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us all. Let us please stand. Our introit for this Sunday is printed there in your bulletin. Let us read that together responsively. The sorrows of death compassed me. And he heard my voice out of his temple. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace that is from above, for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the churches of God, And for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for them that in faith, piety, and fear of God offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help. Save, pity, and defend us, O God, by thy grace. The Lord has
has indeed had mercy and grace upon us. So let us sing to the praise of his name. Oh, take my hand, dear Father. The Lord be with you. Let us continue to pray. O Lord, we ask that in your grace you would hear the prayers of your people, that we who are justly punished for our offenses may be mercifully delivered by your goodness, for the glory of your name, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson today is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, beginning with verse 5. Jeremiah writes, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Here ends the reading of our Old Testament lesson. Our psalm today is Psalm 1. Let's read that together responsively. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does... He prospers. The 
Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Here is the reading of our psalm, our epistle lesson today is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 12. And Paul writes, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Here ends the reading of our epistle lesson, our gradual today. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble, and they they that know your name will be put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken them that seek you. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Our holy gospel lesson this morning is found in the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 6, beginning with the 17th verse. Reading in Jesus' name. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on the disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did this to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Here ends the reading of our gospel lesson today. Let us together confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to welcome each of you here to the house of the Lord again as we are gathered here to worship. Privileged to have you with us today. I ask that you take the red friendship pads and sign them and pass them down the row as a record here of your participation with us. A couple of of notes here today. The chancel uh, arrangement here is given by Mary Lou McKenna in memory of Paul Libel. And so we uh, rejoice uh, the Lord's goodness to us even in difficult times, as well as our altar flowers today given to the glory of God by the Kurtz family. Uh, This past week is the anniversary of Russell Kurtz's uh, death. 
uh, that he uh, sacrificed, that he made for our country. And we continue to remember him and in, in, in gratitude for that and prayer uh, with the Kurtz family as well for comfort for them. And that is, is today why the baptismal candle uh, that was given in his memory has been lit. This week, uh, a couple of announcements regarding the uh, regarding uh, our schedule. Prayer and praise is tonight, 6 p.m. Tuesday, men's group, uh, continuing in that study on the game plan for life. That continues on Tuesday at 7. Is it 7? Is that the right time? Good, 7. All right. Friday, uh, XYZ uh, is is uh, happening. So if you have not signed up for XYZ, please do that today outside of Pat's office over on that side of, of the church. And also Friday, be in prayer for our youth as the 30-hour famine will be happening as well. So, so remember those events, and, and hopefully you can attend uh, some or all of them. Hospital notes, there are a number today, um, and, and some of them are correct in your bulletin. Some have changed. Karen Thompson is, is now home. Lois Christ was in the hospital up at Passivant, uh, she's living in the North Hills now, moved up there closer to her son. But the uh, she has been released from Passivant, is now in the Vincentian home. And uh, just be remembering her. She has gone through a, a respiratory illness, and, and just be remembering her in that time. Tom Alsop was in St. Clair Hospital, but now has been released to Concordia for some rehab. Karen Thorhauer is in Jefferson Hospital. Uh, Karen is there, be in prayer for Karen during this time. Also, um, Chuck DeSalvo was in and and had a, a procedure and is out. He has done well, so continue to be in prayer for Chuck. Also, Virginia Barch. Uh, she is uh, nearing the end of her earthly journey uh, by all accounts. And so be in prayer for Virginia and her family in this time as well. Uh, just to note that, that Carol Mueller's sister, Gertrude McAllister, uh, living out in Washington State, uh, she passed away, uh, so please be in prayer for, for Carol, uh, just for their whole family now during this time uh, of grief. Also, just a reminder that this past week there were services for Jean Potts as well, a mother of Melanie Kruger, uh, grandmother of Amanda Kruger, and we uh, just remember them in, in our prayers too during this time. With that, there are no further announcements, and I will call upon the choirs for message and song.
Our sermon text has been read in its entirety this morning. However, I ask that you remain standing as we read verse 19 again. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus Christ that through his power we can get healing. Through his ability we can be made whole. And through his sacrificial love we can be given hope for the future to be enjoined with him forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Our sermon title this week is He is Able. Amen. And of course, whenever we say or use a pronoun, we need to make sure we define who we're talking about. So I'm speaking, of course, of Jesus Christ. He is able. Jesus is able. God Almighty is able. The song going through my head this morning as I was laying in bed and thinking, and, and we traveled a lot with Noah recently. When Before Ezra came, we used to have a, a, a Bible song CD we would play, and you know, it's probably a good thing we haven't played it in a while because the, the song is, Our God is so good, so strong, and so mighty. My, my, oh, wow. Yeah, there's nothing my God cannot do, right? And the reason it's a good thing we haven't played it recently is because when the kids do it, it's like, my God is so big, you know, and yell out. Is, you know, it's one of those active songs to get them participating. So thankfully, he didn't scream out, but I had the choir to back me up. So I really appreciated that. That was good. Um, but that's the reality of this passage, is we find that our God is so big, that power is the key word here in verse 19. And, and power is a word that means ability. Did you ever think about that before? What does power really mean? We, we look for power, or we seek power, or we talk about somebody who's in power or has power. And the reality behind that is, you know, we may think of strength or we may think of, of some other particular attribute. But the reality is, it means literally the ability to do or the ability to act in some way. So when we speak right now, we're, we're speaking of the ability that God had to act, the ability that God had to do. When we speak of our leaders, we, think, we speak of their ability to lead. When we speak of our, our mothers or fathers, we speak of their ability, perhaps, to parent. When we speak of a student, we speak of their ability to do well and to, to do their work. Whatever the word power is applied, it's, it's an action word, and it, it means that there's something behind it that can back it up, that has the ability to do what it says it can do. When we speak of our, our government, it's probably the easiest example to, to look at the opposite of that, right? That from a human standpoint, that when we speak of ability to do, they often let us down. And that's kind of the high one that, that's always in our focus, in our media focus, but the reality is it comes all the way back down on us, too. And so as we look at the context of what's going on here, it, previously in Luke, Jesus has been going all around the Galilee, the, the, the Sea of the Galilee. He's been preaching in the synagogues, opening up the scriptures and revealing himself to the Jewish people. He's been preaching in the countryside, opening himself up to the common man, the common Jew. He's been preaching in all the area around there. And now we find in verse 17, it says, And he, Jesus, came down with them. Well, who's the them? What's the twelve disciples that he designated apostles. That's who it's referring to here. He has, at this point, established his 12 apostles, and now, after having done so and having been preaching and teaching in the area for a while, he comes down with the apostles, and he stands out on a level place. And so this is similar, this section of Luke is similar to what we call the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew. But here it's on a, a more of a plain level, and there's a great multitude of people that includes the apostles, great crowd of disciples of Jesus, students of Jesus that have been following him around and gaining in, in size of group, and then also just a general group and multitude of people that have been hearing what's been going on in the area of Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which, which this almost has a hint when we look at the text and the context of it of, of even being some Gentiles at this point, which is, it's as early for the Gentiles to come into the picture. It's early for people who were not Jewish, who didn't know God, to be in the picture. But there's a good chance that this crowd included 
people who were seeing Jesus speak and teach and talk, and that was drawing even the people who did not really fully know God. And so they come, they came to hear him, not idly or just in passing, but they were seeking him out to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And we can look at that and we see, oh, is this a great mob of like hospital people, you know, coming along with carrying the, the, the cart of fluids and, and looking to be healed? Well, no, the reality is, is we can relate. This crowd here today would be very representative of some of the people that would have been there. Some who were already called and apostles and serving as, as agents of Christ in the church. Some who are disciples and here learning and, and being disciples and students of Jesus Christ through the word and through the preaching and through the liturgy. And also some who may be visiting today who are not directly a part of the crowd but are here to learn and seek and be a part of God's family. We all can be related to that. And we aren't here today in slings and wrapped in bandages to be healed, but a lot of us have hurts and and diseases in the heart and in the mind that, that aren't visible on the outside to everybody else. There's a lot of wounds in our body and our spirit that, that we need healing for. A lot of losses, personal losses, or a lot of struggles. I think of myself and my own personal testimony right now as my wife and I are in this challenging time of figuring out what is God's will for our future. And what does that look like? It's not us trying to dictate, but us trying to, to see how can God heal us from this anxiety and this stress and this turmoil of, of like, which church are we going to be going to and which part of the country are we going to live in? And we have to move out either way in May. And, and uh, that can be terrifying if we don't have a God who is able to back us up with his trust. And our trust and faith in him is sure. He has not failed us in the past. We know he is able because of what he has done before. Our passage in 1 Corinthians 15 today speaks to that. If our faith and our trust in Jesus was just based on his, his teaching and his life, it wouldn't be enough. It's based on the reality that he was able to not only teach and lead and tell us how to live and to instruct us, but he was able to provide not just this life, but the next life. The fact that our faith is based on his resurrection his death and resurrection to eternal life, that there's more to this world, the world that we suffer in, and we have all these, these diseases and these, these troubles that bother us. There's more than just, just this day or the next day, but there's beyond. There's more to it. There's the, the eternity with him. And that sets our context as well today, too, that it's not just about us and today, but it's about that eternal future with God. And the fact that he is powerful. He is able to heal. And what does it mean to heal? It means to make whole. Many of us could stand up here and give testimony to all the different things that have happened in our life that have taken pieces out of us, that have attacked the wholeness that we have. Sometimes in in our minds and in our hearts. Sometimes physically parts of our body that, that begin to fail. But Jesus, he comes, the crowd seeking to touch and lay hold of him, for power was coming out from him and healing them all. Power was making them whole. Physically, we see that in miraculous healings throughout the word, but also their spiritual health and their anxiety was taken away. He was giving them peace. He was giving them joy. He was giving them comfort and consolation. He was providing everything they needed even though they didn't even know what they fully needed, probably, in some cases, just as we don't. And what's significant here is we begin to look at and and move into the other part of our text, which is the blessings and the woes. What's significant is to know that they were seeking. They weren't just idly there, but they sought to touch him. It's not just, let me me just accidentally rub against you. It's they sought to reach out and grasp him. They wanted... to to embrace him and be a part of his life. They wanted to know him more intimately. They weren't just coming there to to hear a good word, to be encouraged. They were coming to be affected by that word and by his life. And they were. And as he heals them, he teaches him in these, these sections of blessings and curses. And we see these throughout Scripture in various ways, even in our other readings from Jeremiah and from the first psalm. 
We see that, and we see that in, in other places in the New Testament as well. These, this idea of those who are blessed and who are, are made righteous and who are made whole through God and contrasted with those who aren't able to do it on their own because we are not as powerful. We are not as able as God is. And so it begins, and it says, Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who weep. And blessed are you who are hated. Because the contrast is that God gives the poor the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing more rich than that. God gives the hungry satisfaction fully. They will hunger no longer. Those weeping shall laugh. And those who are hated can rejoice if it's on account of God, if it's on account of the Son of Man. Because he is able to provide anything and everything, not only in this world, but in the next. He gives us eternal life with him, with love and peace and all that, that God is. There's no greater reward. And we think on a daily basis how we struggle and how we suffer. And most of that suffering is because of these next woes when we try. Well, let me frame it this way. We think of it as these statements are identity statements. They are, they are conditional identity statements. So if our identity is wrapped up in our teacher, in our Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in his power and his ability, if our identity is wrapped up in that, then we are blessed because we, we find ourselves poor knowing he can provide for us. And we find ourselves hungry knowing he can satisfy us. Now the contrast is true, though, when we find our identity wrapped up in the individual things themselves that are professed here. So if you wake up one morning and you're like, oh, what a great day, you know, I am so rich and I've, oh, I've got all these things and I have arrived, I have made it. I have everything I could ever want. Well, you've received your consolation because what you have, everything you have, the clothes on your back right now and whatever you're planning for the rest of your day, a thousand years from now, that's all going to be gone. Your clothes will be decayed, any wealth you have will be long forgotten. Your name in this country, in this town, whatever, who's going to remember you a thousand years, ten thousand years from now? And that's, that's what it's speaking to here. Woe are the rich who are wrapped up in their wealth, in their claim to have things that they did not create and that they did not make and that they did not earn. They have received their comfort now because they, that vain comfort is not eternal. The same thing, those who are full now, we often take for granted our, our society, how we, we often don't have to go without a meal. I really appreciate that the youth group are having that, that day of fasting coming up soon. It's a great time to to think about all the people in the world who, who don't have a convenience store just down the road or a Ruth Fred Market right across the street, right? Where we can get some great meat. Um, but there are many out there who, who are hungering and, and they are blessed because they, God can provide for them. But in the meanwhile, those who are full and are satisfied and be like, oh, I can just go wherever, when I can get a meal whenever I need. If you're taking that for granted, you... You are full and satisfied now, but you will be hungry in eternity if, if it's not connected to Jesus. And this next one is especially poignant lately as I think about New York and the, the vote on abortion there and, and the laughing and the mocking of the senators there and, and the, the government there. It really puts a, a great picture on this. Woe to you who laugh now, laughing out of ignorance. They do not know what they do They're, in their ignorance. For they, when they realize, when they, when they come face to face with their creator and realize the fullness of what life matters and what really mattered that they have missed out on, then there surely will be mourning and weeping for them. And it's such a, a, a perfect picture of the timing of this right now. And, and it, the reality is it's out of ignorance. If we, again, thinking of the context of the Bible, we don't want to take this out of context. The very next section of Luke talks about having love for our enemies. And that's largely driven because they, what they are doing when they're laughing over evil things. It's because they do not know God. They do not know Christ. They only know themselves and the power and ability they have. And they think that's the end-all, be-all. They're like, oh, hey, we're, we're in charge of many. We're in charge of much. We have power. We have ability. But if they really were to take a look inside and look at the life around them, they would see that 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 power, that ability that they think they have is nothing compared to the power and ability of God. And often as time goes on, their power and ability quickly washes away. Their circumstances change. 
the governor of Virginia recently probably thought he was really powerful and, and all of a sudden something comes out from his past and totally undermines all of that. And we're no better or worse than the blessed or the poor here. If we are not connecting our blessedness with God, we are just as bankrupt and, and woeful and we need to repent and fall on God's feet. Let us not be ignorant. We need to be like those people that were coming out to hear Jesus. We need to be seeking actively to, to grasp him. And that by that, we can do that. We can't do that physically with him today because Jesus is waiting to return to us. But we have his word, which we should be seeking actively to, to be in. Whenever we're anxious, when we're struggling, like right now, my, you know, my wife and I, as we're looking for our call, where is God going to call us? We go to his word. We go to prayer. We go to the counsel of other fellow believers, the body of Christ. That is how we can seize and grasp him. That is where we can draw our comfort from. That is where we get made whole and we get healed because he is able and he has revealed himself through his Holy Spirit and through his word. And he reveals himself to, each, to the world through his body, the church. And his body is made whole through the word and through prayer. And through one another coming together and sharpening one another. Our God created us. And through that, he is able to dictate to his creation. He loved us. And through that, he was able to come and sacrifice himself for us out of his love. And through that, he is able and willing to redeem you. And he has redeemed you. And that redemption means that there is nothing more that you need to do other than to, to look to him for your blessing. When you find yourself poor in spirit, hungry for an answer from God, when you find yourself weeping or mourning as we think of a loss of a loved one this morning that we heard about, fall on our knees to Jesus for that healing that we need, for that comfort we need. Dive into his word. The Psalms are a great consolation, but the rest of his word also teaching and instructing us and giving us encouragement. And then fall on the shoulders and on the arms of your fellow neighbor Christians. Look to them for good biblical counsel as well. We need to be there for one another, for we are the body of Christ. And he gives us power through his word and through what he did on the cross and through his sacraments. And be reminded of that this morning. And I I apply it to you now, first first and foremost, as the church thinks about what does the future look like. As as you look to calling a future pastor, make sure that you do it on on the power of Christ and through his word and prayerfully considering what does God have in mind for the future of Ruth Fred Lutheran Church. We don't want it to be our human choices, but we want it to be God's choice for, for the future path of Ruth Red. And then as we look to the body that is here currently, what is God calling each of us to do? How is he enabling you through his power? And look for those opportunities and ways to serve one another. When you see a fellow person hurting or in need, step forward and be Christ to them. Give them an encouraging word from God. So remember that today, that When you are lacking, God is never lacking. He is always able. Jesus Christ is always able. No matter how big the thing is that you feel is waiting on your shoulders, how big that burden is, he can take that burden away. But you have to seek him, and you have to to come to hear him through his word and prayer. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Amen.
Father in heaven, again, we thank you for your son and his sacrifice for us on the cross and especially for his resurrection from the dead. We ask that you make the, through these gifts the ability for your power to go forth through your kingdom, through your body on earth, through your body, the church. Lord, use these gifts and the talents and, and the time of the people here to bless others and to bring others to a growing knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Invite the congregation to kneel or bow as you are able as we close in prayer. Almighty God, we can't thank you enough for all the gifts and the abilities that you've bestowed upon us. We can't thank you enough for the healing that you bring to us and the, the, the wonderful treasures that you have available through us or to us through your word, Lord and through prayer, and through the body of the church that you have given us, that we can be comforted through your word and through a hand and a, and a heart shared from one another. We ask this morning, Lord, that you bring comfort to those who are struggling physically. We think of Karen and Lois, Karen Thompson as well as Thorhauer, and Chuck DeSalvo in his healing, Lord, and Tom Elsop as well. And we ask also for your Continuing comfort and peace to be with Virginia in her declining time here, Lord. And we pray also for the losses of, of the Mueller family uh, through the loss of Gertrude recently, Lord, and then also the Potts family. We ask that you bring your healing and comfort in this time, that you bring your people together around and, and bring comfort to one another, Lord, that we can be encouraged through your word and through prayer and through this time of reflection on the lives that have been lived and Lord, we ask that our identity, that our gaze always be upon you, that, that our understanding of how we are to live and, and what this world is all about and why things are the way they are, that it be always colored through the lens of you and what you did for us and the, the teaching that you give to us, Lord, that instructs us and guides us and gives us understanding, not only of why, but how, how you are able to provide healing and expectations and hope for the future, Lord. We pray, lift up our nation this morning, our country, that you provide knowledge and understanding, that you remove the veil of ignorance from our leadership that does not know you, and that those who do know you, Lord, we ask that you encourage and embolden them to go forth with your power and ability to convert and evangelize people, to share your word and your love with the leaders. And also at our state level, Lord, we ask for that guidance, that the wisdom and knowledge of your word be brought to them to bear. And in our communities, where it begins to get a little more personal, Lord, we ask that you empower us to reach out into each of the communities in which we live, to reach out to our neighbor at the store and our neighbor in our neighborhood, to be ever-present as an emissary of you, Lord, a disciple of you, always able to provide an answer always able to provide direction into your word for those who need encouragement and understanding, to be the source and guidance of healing, to, to bring them to you for a fuller healing and, and to be made whole, not just in this world, but in the next, Lord. And we ask for ourselves that you continue to bless and guide us through your word and through this church here. Lift up Ruth Fred this morning as well. And in their future, we ask that you guide them in their understanding. And Lord, anything that remains on our hearts this morning that people and us we have not shared, we ask that that be shared now silently. And Lord, thank you for teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord and Savior. May the Lord make his... May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his almighty peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.